as well. On cue, thank you, Lauren. <laughs> Okay, great. It's one minute past the hour. We have 22 people. So why don't we get started? Um, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Proto OKN seminar today. And we're really delighted that I'm Florence Hudson. I'm on the Educate team, the Theme 3 team, one of the co-PIs. And we're really delighted that Doug Downey has agreed to present to us today and have a discussion about the work that he does um, that actually, I think, started with the Convergence Accelerator Track A and he's at the Allen Institute for AI now. And uh, Jemin and Chaitin had wanted us to talk to Doug and have him present because they said that um, Doug has been developing tools that could be valuable for the current proto OKN projects. And maybe it will encourage some of us to leverage these tools in our efforts. So I'm really excited about hearing all about this. Um, and so Doug, thank you for joining early. It's a little earlier um, out in, uh, in California. And uh, Doug has graciously said that you can ask questions as they come up. Um, he planned on you know, presenting for about 45 minutes, so that means about 15 minutes of questions. So if we ask too many questions, we might have to speed up at the end. But if there are some burning questions, he said it's okay to ask. And now I'd like to pass it over to Doug. Um, thank you very much, Florence. Um, so it's great to be with you here today. Uh, I'm gonna present. Um, some of the work we did uh, as, as, as part of the Convergence Accelerator program, which was focused on, on OKNs. Um, so a little bit of background, I work on the Semantic Scholar team at the Allen Institute for AI, and we're motivated by um, a problem which is probably not news to a lot of the folks uh, on this call. The pace of, of scientific publication is growing continuously and scientists have an increasingly hard time learning about the most important developments in their field. Um, maybe if we could automatically extract knowledge networks from science, uh, that might allow scientists to understand and draw insights from literature much more rapidly, which could accelerate science and benefit humankind. So that's kind of the, the goal we're going after at a high level. Um, we were part of the first track, uh, as, as Florence said, of the Convergence Accelerator Program from uh, 2020 to 2023. Um, and... That track was aimed at developing open knowledge networks and their tools and applications. Um, within that project at AI2, our team focused on two things. One was building a particular open knowledge network for, uh, for science that was called CORD19, which was a bibliographic knowledge network of papers about COVID-19 and related topics. I won't say much about that today, although we were happy with that work. It was the most upvoted data set in the history of the Kaggle platform uh, at, at the time it was released. But what I will talk about today is the second thing, uh, this infrastructure for extracting OKNs from scientific papers. So I'll describe a set of new methods we developed and associated tools that we released implementing those methods. Um, to preface this discussion, even though the use cases I'm talking about focus on mining scientific papers, I tried to select portions of our work that could be adapted to other use cases as well. So I'm hoping the challenges I discuss like extracting from PDF documents or producing structured data from text will be more broadly useful to this audience. Um, I, I would reiterate, please do jump in with, with questions as I go, because I really do want this material to be helpful for, for you. Um, and so if there are uh, you know, que questions about how something I'm describing might be useful for your use case, um, please feel free to jump in and, and ask about that. Maybe I can uh, shed some light on it. Okay, the work I'll be talking about today is organized around this little pipeline for producing OKNs from scientific documents. So on the left, we have raw PDFs as input, which for better or worse is the form that most scientific content takes today. Our first task is to extract from those PDF files a structured representation, as shown as a JSON file here, that includes all the content organized into categories. So these tokens of the document represent the title, these others are the authors, you know, body text, captions, bibliography, et cetera. From there, I'll describe how we arrive at what I'm calling a concept graph. And this is a lightweight OKN that includes scientific concepts and their descriptions, along with links between concepts and the papers that discuss them. Finally, to consume this graph within the latest and greatest AI models, you often need vector embeddings of the graph elements. And I'll talk about new methods we developed for learning vector representations of scientific papers. 
Okay, so jumping right into this first task, we're given a raw PDF, and our goal is to output a structured JSON of, of the content, um, pulling out the, the functional elements of the document. And I should mention, we're running this at scale on millions of PDFs, so we need to use small models. You know, we're not gonna call uh, GPT-4 for you know, each one of these uh, PDF documents. So starting with a little bit of background on, on this task, um, a classical approach to this would extract the textual tokens from the PDF um, using a low-level extractor. There are many of these, but PDF Plumber is a popular one. And then we would feed those tokens into uh, a, a transformer machine learning model to classify each token in, into a category. Um, the, the work we did tried to also use visual signals of, uh, of the PDF in addition to the text. And that was what we were trying to innovate on. Um, some previous work uh, from a few years ago called Layout LM um, showed how you can get improved accuracy on this task if you don't only use the textual tokens, but you also incorporate the visual layout in the PDF. So the intuition is the visual signals and documents often uh, tell us which categories tokens belong to. So notice that the title of this document is at the top of the page, it's in a little bit of a bigger font, it's visually offset from the authors. So these are all clues that that's a different semantic category of text than the stuff that lies below it. The way this previous layout LM work incorporated the visual signal was by first starting with the textual information, which is presented to this transformer language model in the form of a set of embeddings. So these are learned parameters representing each unique input token. So that the word construction has one learned embedding, literature has another, and so on. And then layout LM adds to this these additional embeddings, um, or sorry, adds to these embeddings additional ones that reflect the position and size of the token on the page. Um, then the model takes this new combined embedding as input, and it can use both the textual and the position features in order to classify tokens. This works pretty well. So improving uh, accuracy is in terms of you know, the F1 measure in, in token classification by 2%, which is a meaningful improvement. Um, the problem is because the layout information is tightly coupled with the textual information at the input to the network, in order to get the model to use this new signal, you have to re-pre-train it. So you know, go through a task of running back propagation over large numbers of raw documents, which is very computationally expensive, takes many hundreds of hours of pre-training if you want to get the best performance. Okay, the approach we developed, by contrast, was based on the idea that in scientific documents, the layout structure often reflects the classes of tokens in a very simple way. So tokens that appear in the same visual block tend, all else being equal, to be of the same category. So notice here, the abstract of this paper appears in one block, and the section header is in the separate blo block below that, um, and, and so on. So to exploit this simple intuition, uh, we came up with this method called iVilla, which uses a purely textual representation of the page, but we reflect the breaks in those visual blocks, um, which we can detect with like a lightweight vision model in advance, using special tokens within the, the, the text. So here on the right, you see the text of the input passage, and we're just representing the breaks between the visual blocks with this new special BLK token. Um, and then we can just feed this text into an existing pre-trained language model with no new with no new visual embedding input. All right, so why, why is this approach an improvement? Well, it's not more accurate. In fact, it's ever so slightly less accurate than, than layout LM. Uh, that, that previous work. It's also not faster at like inference time. We're using small models here, which is good, so it can scale, but it's no faster than you know layout LM. Um, the advantage though, is that you don't need any new pre-training. So because you're using just these lightweight block indicators, you can just fine tune the model on this, uh, this PDF extraction task, and you don't need to go through this expensive pre-training to like alter the model in a more fundamental way. This is a big deal because when new models come out, which happens all the time today, um, you don't. Uh, we can use them right off the shelf. You can just plug and play uh, those models. You don't need to re-pre-train them, um, and, and so, so that we thought was was a big a big benefit. Um, just briefly, here are some results with this approach. 
Um, you know, our, our method called iVilla works pretty well across a variety of base models. You can also, you know, build this on top of layout LM, which is what you're seeing in the last, uh, last row of this table. Um, <clears throat> one last wrinkle I'll mention about this work. Uh, this technique also enables you to generalize better to new layouts. So the experiments I just showed evaluated on a diversity of different kinds of visual layouts, but the distribution of layouts at test time was the same as the distribution seen during training. So in this other work by, by Kathy Chen, we investigated how well models trained on a particular small set of layouts could extend to new layouts not seen in training. Um, so we contrasted this, uh, this in-distribution uh, training setting with this other out of distribution setting where models were trained on one set of layouts and tested on a distinct held out layout. This is a harder problem. Um, and you can see that all models tend to show a degradation in performance when they're extended to these new layouts that they've never seen before. But our iVilla approach showed less of a degradation than, um, than the competing models. Okay, so I described iVilla, this new technique we developed, and, and kind of uh, some results about why it's good. Um, associated with this, we also released a set of software. So this is a set of tools that uh, you know I hope could could be relevant to you folks if you're working with with PDF documents. This not only included the models that I just discussed, but we bundled all of our PDF processing tools into a system we call Paper Mage, which is intended to be a full service toolkit for processing visually rich documents. Um, it mostly centers on documents in PDF format, but can also be used for other, other formats. The toolkit has three main ingredients. Um, the, the first is a library that makes it easy to represent and manipulate visually rich documents. I'll say some more about that in a moment. Um, and then there are predictors that integrate different scientific document processing model, modules in a unified interface. This is important because um, there's a very fragmented ecosystem out there of, of document processing tools and Paper Mage makes it easier to use those disparate things within a single code base. Um, the predictors here include the, uh, the pre-trained weights from the Villa models I just discussed along with, with other models. Finally, there's what we call recipes. So recipes implement state-of-the-art pipelines, provide turnkey access to uh, strong PDF processing workflows. Here's at a glance what can happen when you run a recipe. So the recipe runs multiple models that operate across different data modalities and different machine learning frameworks to extract document structure and represent it as layers uh, of annotation over the document. As a user, you can then access and manipulate these layers. So notice at the bottom of the figure, um, you're typing dot, uh, doc dot, and you get back a list of the, uh, of the accessible layers. Um, the illustrated recipe on this slide runs tools from three different packages. So layout parser to get the lower level text and visual structure, spacey to get sentence breaking, and then finally learned transformers from Hugging Face, like iVilla would be one of these, uh, to get semantic elements like titles, authors, uh, and so on. Paper Mage makes it possible to access all of these different outputs from different code bases within a, a unified data structure. Here's what this looks like concretely on an individual PDF document. So the doc data structure you get back from Paper Mage allows you to get like the first paragraph of the document um, programmatically. That's in the upper left of this slide. Just below that, you could ask for the second sentence of that paragraph, which also happens to be the second sentence of the document. Um, the following examples show you can access particular tokens, figures, captions. Um, notice, we are, you can't see this from the slide, but uh, with, with all of these examples, the data structures contain not only the textual representation of the tokens, but uh, you know, and that you can save in a text file or run through a, a large language model, but they also contain the visual coordinates of these tokens. So if you wanted to leverage the visual signal in a different way or go back and identify where these tokens are in the original PDF, that's possible to do. Um, finally, the example in gray is maybe the most interesting. There the user drags out a rectangle in, in the PDF and, and Paper Mage can tell you which tokens fall within that visual selection. Um, okay, so here's a quick demo of this thing in, in action. Um, let, me, uh, let me try to do this. Uh, let's see. Um, I'll just quickly go to papermage.org. Um, 
All right, folks can see this demo. Yes. Okay, good. So um, here's kind of it, it working in this browser. I'll make this much larger. Um, so, uh, you know, here we see uh, a, a, a PDF file and we're asking actually, um, we're asking paper made for the rows, which are lines of the document and they can be, you know, titles or, or authors and so on. Um, digging into this a little bit more, you know, we could ask Paper Mage for the tokens of, of the abstract. So we first ask for the abstract and then we ask for the tokens of that. And that gives us, you know, these little bounding boxes around each of these different token elements. And, you know, I'm highlighting this word when, um, and you can see over on the left-hand side what the code gives you about this token. You get this boxes representing the visual bounding box metadata, which gives you the font name and size, um, this spans data structure, which says where uh, these characters occur in, in the span of the document, and finally the text. Uh, and often for many applications, you just want the text, but all of these other things are there for you uh, if you want them. Um, to show that other uh, that other capability we, we just talked about, so user selection, you know, I can hear, uh, I can select the, the figure, and Paper Mage gives me all of the tokens that are within that selection. Um, and uh, I can also, you know, take a take a step back and ask for captions. And Paper Mage gives me a full box around, you know, this, this entire caption object that is detected in the document. Um, so you can take, you know, a PDF and, and process it with these tools and get this representation that is pretty clean and, and pretty rich. Uh, and, and we're using this code um, for, for a bunch of uses within uh, within Semantic Scholar. Um, all right, uh, continuing with uh, the the presentation, one more quick thing about um, about Paper Mage uh, is how to get the code. So all the stuff, all all the code I talked about is is open source. You can just grab it. Um, there's also this demo I just went to at, at papermage.org is available online. Um, all right, that's it for Paper Mage. I was going to jump into the next um, the next stage in the pipeline and talk about a different set of tools. Maybe I'll pause for one second if there are any questions at this point. Otherwise, I'll I'll just keep going. I'll just ask quickly, Doug. Could you put that uh, GitHub link in the chat? Would you mind? I was trying to write it down, but I was too slow. <laughs> um, Absolutely, I can do that. Um, Awful. Yeah, let me, uh, I'll, I'll just do it right now. Um, yeah. We're a hands-on type of crowd, I think. That's, you know, that's great. Um, so yeah, any any questions at this point? Any questions? Um, yeah, can I just ask a quick question here? <clears throat> sure, go ahead, Karthik. Uh, hey, thank you. Uh, so this is, this is really interesting. Uh, my quick question over here is that, so how is this different from a tool like uh, um, LLM Sherpa, it's called, where you can extract the hierarchical structure of a PDF document, um, like the sections, sentences, and all these things. So what what is this additional advantage that we get from uh, from a paper paper mage that you mentioned? Um. I think that, um, so I'm not familiar actually with the, the tool you just mentioned. Sorry, what, can you say that name again? Sure, it's called uh, LLM Sherpa. Uh, let me just put in the... Uh, okay, LLM Sherpa. Um, yeah. Interesting. I guess I'm not familiar with it. So I can say a couple of things. Um, there are, I mean, so, you know, uh, you can also send these PDFs to... Um, to commercial closed LLMs, uh, and you know they they can process them fairly well. So you know Claude, for example, um, you know it's pretty easy to just add a, a PDF input there. Um, I I guess there are uh, th there may be differences in expense. So you know the um, the models I just described uh, are, are small scale. So they're like BERT sized models. And it's really economical to run those over you know, millions of PDFs. So if you need to scale, that's that's one, um, one potential use of these things. Um, 
I, I also, you know, on the benchmarks we've, we've released, we think we get competitive performance. I mean, that's like what those, you know, those comparisons against layout LM, which is, there are three versions of that. Uh, and, you know, the, the latest one is quite recent. Um, we, we think those are competitive baselines. I, and, you know, in the paper mage paper, we, we compare against Growbid, which is another popular open source thing. Um, I, I will say, uh, so, so we think our, our extractors are competitive with those, uh, with those packages. Um, I wouldn't say we've, we've benchmarked against any, everything. Um, we do in the paper mage paper show, show, uh, improvements over Growbid, but, you know, that's on a particular data set and, and your mileage may vary. Um, the paper mage toolkit though allows you to use a variety of, of third-party tools so i mean while i haven't looked at this integration in particular i would imagine that you know llm sherp is actually easy to use within paper mage and you could get all these other benefits like being able to integrate other machine learning models like you want to run spacey over the tokens of the document in paper mage that's built to be easy, right? So a fairly easy operation. Um, if you're just using, you know, uh, a, a separate, um, a, a single pass package to do the uh, to, to do the PDF processing, then you'd have to write this sort of glue code to transfer that that system's output into um, into what Spacey needs as input. Paper Mage has the intention of making all of that lower friction for you as a user. I see. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. So I so I understand that Paper Mage has this added flexibility to utilize these third party uh, libraries into it. That that's that's right. It's it's okay. built to be extensible to to new libraries. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks for the question. Um. Yeah, and, and for the pointer to that package, which I had not had not heard about. Any other questions at this point? I have I have one quick question. Um, I I think that's it, it looks really great. And um, have have you all? Uh, I could see using that as a platform to build other things on top of it, like user curation tools and things like that. And I'm wondering if if there's anything like that out there. Um. So I haven't. Um. You know, we've talked about that a little bit in internally. So yeah, often you want to annotate PDFs. Um. And uh, we we had a previous tool called Pauls, um, which you know is, you may have heard of from like three or four years ago, uh, that made certain kinds of annotation easy, but had a bunch of of shortcomings. We do think Paper Mage is a better foundation for that. Um, we haven't built, nor am I aware of, of anybody having built yet uh, an annotation interface that that lives on top of Paper Mage. But yeah, it does seem like a natural use case. Um, so yeah, I think it's a good thought. Um, as far as I know, it doesn't exist yet. All right, thanks. So cool. Doug's getting a couple of questions about other like kind of extensibility opportunities, like you said, and no is an okay answer, <laughs> but uh, does your team help with stuff like that? Like if, you know, Chris or Karthik are like, well, I'm trying to do this and I can't really get it done. Do you have any type of, you know, help or just because we're friends, we could ask you or how would that work? Um, so that's a great question. I think the the way I would probably start to, um, to to pursue that is actually by posting. You know, if you try to integrate and um, and it's not working, posting issues on the the GitHub board so you can get um, you know access to uh, Kyle Lowe and Lucas Soldani, who are the experts on this code. Um, I believe they're uh, re relatively responsive to those questions with this code base, even though um, they have a, a variety of other things going on. So that might be my first suggestion. Um, I, yeah, I guess I'm not. Um, and then, right, if you, if you kind of don't get the answers that, that you want, I, I certainly wouldn't mind you sending me a note. There might not be much I can do to, to help um personally but uh but i would like to know if if things aren't working the way you want uh that that'd be helpful for me so uh and there might be pointers i i could offer to sort of get um uh more helpful advice that's very thoughtful thank you the github uh, first pass sounds like a good idea though so that's more scalable than asking you to answer all our questions so we can try that first so thank you very much
Cool. Sounds sounds good. All right. Well, I'll um I'll, I'll jump forward. Uh, I, I think pa paper mage was probably the um the the longest of of the, the sections of this talk. So the the next two will go faster, but um, but we'll see. So the next step is taking this paper content and extracting a structured graph from it. Um, and to say a little bit more about what I mean uh, about the structured graph, um, the ultimate aspiration of this work was to generate a Wikipedia for the long tail of science. So Wikipedia is a hugely useful resource for people to learn about topics, but for science, it's wildly incomplete, covering only the most popular topics. There are lots of notable ones that don't have Wikipedia pages. Scientists don't want to manually write th these pages, so our goal would be to create them automatically from scientific papers. Um, automatically generating full Wikipedia pages, I think is really hard, even with large language models. I don't think we could do it at high accuracy. Um, and one of the goals of, of this work was actually to build something that's high accuracy that we can put in front of semantic scholars, 8 million monthly active users. So we used what I would say is an underrated strategy in the era of LLMs, which is radically reducing the scope of the task. So instead of going after full encyclopedic descriptions, we're aiming at only short ones. Plus our graph will include links to papers um, for people to get more information if they want it. Then we worked hard to design uh, a, a system that does that. So uh, let, me, um, let me show this system uh, re really quick. Uh, here's kind of what it looks like. So um, uh, a, a user can come here and uh, you know search for a topic of their choice. One of my favorites is unique case at um, where you know if if you ask ChatGPT what unique case that is, it, it has a tendency to hallucinate. Um, but uh, here, because we're drawing from scientific papers, we um, we can actually get a correct description. So here's the concept, here's a, a description of it. It's short, it's only two sentences, a list of related topics here on the right-hand side. Um, and you know, here is the paper that that description is drawn from. This is the paper that's often cited for this topic. Here's some other foundational papers often cited for it. And then recent papers you know, saying what the, you know, the, uh, some recent results on this topic are. Okay. So that is, uh, that's unique case hat. Um, so, and, and that's a demo of the topic pages. So there are two key challenges that we had to answer here. Um, the, the first was, what are the concepts? So, um, you know, we chose the unique case hat was a concept, but uh, th there are all kinds of strings that occur in scientific papers. How do we decide which ones deserve a topic page. Um, and then uh, the, the second is how to generate descriptions and make them accurate. So I'll talk about each one of these um, briefly. Okay, first for finding concepts, we built the following pipeline that crawls scientific papers and extracts the concepts from them. So we start with the Semantic Scholar Open Research Corpus or STORC. This is a freely available open source resource full of, uh, of scientific papers, both abstracts and for a set of papers full text. Um, then we extract all the mentions of terms of text in this corpus. Um, this extraction step needs to be fast and low cost. We're running it over every paper. So we started out using SciSpacey, um, which is a term extractor, but found that uh, Roberta, uh, our own Roberta model trained on silver labels output by GPT was better. Then we apply that system to all the papers we've got, and we get a huge number of mentions of terms um, identified by our extractor. And now we have to determine which of these are bona fide topics. So in this sentence, CNN is a good topic. It should have a topic page, but input graph is, is not. It's a generic term. And we identify the good topics from the bad using an approach we call foresight. So foresight's task involves determining which of the terms are real concepts. That's kind of a subjective notion, but for our purposes, we define it as topics for which scientists might want a Wikipedia page. And we were actually able to get high inner annotator agreement using that definition. So here I'm listing three real concepts on the left. These are specific enough. You could describe them on a page. The ones on the right are like common noun phrases in science, but too abstract to actually be described in, in a Wikipedia page. The intuition that our method uses to identify the real concepts 
relies on the citation graph. So many of you have probably seen sentences like this, where people use the term BERT and then cite a particular paper. This is the paper that introduced BERT. We exploit this intuition by saying real concepts will tend to co-occur with a citation to a particular paper. Um, here's what this looks like graphically. Uh, denote a phrase subgraph as a subset of the citation graph that contains all papers with a particular phrase. On this slide, I've got two different phrase subgraphs. They each have five papers, but they have somewhat different edges. Um, prior work on our task uses the intuition that real concepts are more likely to have dense phrase subgraphs um, with more inside the graph edges. This makes sense because if, if you're a paper that mentions BERT, you tend to cite other papers that also mention BERT. This heuristic actually works pretty well in practice. Our approach, though, uses a different intuition that concepts are introduced or popularized by a single paper, which we call an introducing paper. So like most, most papers, including BERT, also cite Devlin et al., as we saw. So prior work would treat these two subgraphs on this slide as the same because they're equally dense. Our approach would assign a much higher score to the concept on the right, or the concept graph on the right, because it uh, appears to have an introducing paper, one paper with lots of, uh, of in-linking citation edges. So Foresight returns a score for each term that we see based on the previous intuition. I won't belabor the mathematical expression, just want to say this is a very simple expression and it's easy to apply at scale using statistics computed over the papers. And this approach works surprisingly well. So for the highest ranked extracted, extracted terms, Foresight is much more precise than the CNLC and lower systems uh, from previous work that also use the citation graph. Um, he, here's a picture of kind of what the output of Foresight looks like qualitatively. Um, these are the top five ranked extractions of, of these three different methods. Um, they're all pretty good. So there's only one of these that we call a mistake. But you can see how Foresight kind of differs from these previous methods. It's biased towards specific systems where a single unambiguous introducing paper exists. Um, you might also notice the phrases in this table aren't like brand new. These are a little old fashioned if you're familiar with these terms. Um, this evaluation was done in 2020. Uh, so this is a little bit of an older technique, but we found it was still useful today um, for, for scalably identifying the set of concepts to use uh, for our, our, our topic pages. Okay, so how about this problem of generating descriptions? Um, so we use LLMs for this, uh, but, but we had to iterate a little bit on, on how to do it. So we, we supply an LLM with one or more papers with the highest foresight score. So that is ones with the most in-links from papers that mention the term. Um, and, and we asked the LLM to generate just a short description. So in order to ensure high quality output, um, we found that it was helpful to treat rare concepts differently from common ones. So for rare concepts, and you know, unique case that would be one of these, to prevent hallucination, it was critical to ask the LLM to draw its output directly um, from the single paper with the highest foresight score. That is, we explicitly ask it to not use knowledge in its parameters or to attempt multi-doc synthesis across multiple papers. Whereas for more common concepts, the LLM parameters are more reliable and the LLM can often produce a more fluent and complete description um, than one that just uses a single paper. So we instead provide a set of papers as context for these common concepts and allow the LLM to generate its best output, you know, drawing from those contextual papers in the way it, it sees fit. Um, so that, that division between common and, and rare was, was helpful. We also did a bunch of manual prompt engineering. Um, so here's a, a part of what that looks like. Um, here's how the prompt to the LLM begins. Um, we start by telling it that it's Neil deGrasse Tyson and that it's really good at communicating science. Um, I don't have any numbers to support this, but um, I'm told from the person who wrote this, is Sergi Feldman, um, a really top-notch research scientist on the team. Um, I'm told that this kind of thing, so get, getting the LLM to feel confident about the task it's about to perform, um, is actually helpful enough to include. And that's just like the bewildering world that we live in when doing applied natural language processing in, in 2024. Um, there's also a more straightforward set of guidance in the prompt where we're asking the LLM to exclude a bunch of failure modes that we observed through trial and error in development. Okay, so we did all this work. And uh, as you can see, this application is running live. You can, you can actually get to those topic pages from the main Semantic Scholar website. 
Um, we've been asking users for feedback and we found an 88% approval rate to this question about whether the, the description is good. That's a pretty high number for real applications. We're relatively happy with it, but clearly there's also you know, significant room for improvement. I'd also note, it, note how cheap this application is. So the workflow we designed you know, for this simplified task allows us to use the cheapest LLMs. So we're using GPT 3.5 or 4.0 mini, um, and, and we still achieve this, this level of quality. All right, so here's resources for this work. Um, the Foresight code is open source. The demo is available in a couple of forms. Um, we, we are going to release the concept graph itself. We just haven't yet. Um, the pipeline I described actually has some problems with synonymy. Um, so the same kinds of being referred to by different names. And we're trying to fix that before we release this resource. Um, we expect it to be out before, before the end of the year. All right, before I jump to the last part of the talk, any questions about this stuff? So Lilith put something, um, she was asking if you could drop the link to the beta test page. I don't know if that's for public consumption or not. It absolutely is. Um, yeah, you can also get that from Semantic Scholar, but let me um, let me just throw it in the chat. Um, Very thoughtful, thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks for uh, thanks for asking. Um, let's see here. Can I do this? No. Um, there we go. Super. Um, any other questions about this stuff? I can jump into the last part. I don't see any hands. I don't always see them though. If there's anybody, you can just speak up. I had one quick question for the for the concept graph. Um, uh, yeah, I, I was going to ask about the uh, synonym issue, but but you kind of addressed that. But I'm wondering, are you are you are you when that graph is released? Are you going to have um, I don't know any any pointers to other vocabularies for those concepts? You know, Wikidata concepts or things like that. Um, we hadn't planned on it. Uh, it would be great to unify with existing resources and like for sure if there's already a Wikipedia page for for these concepts, you'll get a better description from there. Um, than, than what we generate. You know, you'll, you'll tend to get something much more complete. I don't know, is there an external resource you would really like us to integrate with? I mean, I think, well, in OKN, I don't want to speak for others, but um, the, two, the two things that kind of pop into my head are um, uh, uh, Wikidata and OpenAlex uh, as, as resources that I think integration would, would help us. Okay, got it. Um, I think it'd be really interesting to integrate and yeah, to this question in the in the chat, um, how, how do how do our topics compare to this uh, e, e, those CWTS topics using Open Alex? We haven't done that comparison, and it does seem important. You have know, some amount of alignment uh, of of our uh, ontology to theirs seems necessary to actually do that to, to do that experimentation. So we'll take a look. Yeah, I, I guess I, I, yeah, I don't have an answer to that right now, um, but I think uh, it, it's a great question. And if, if we have the bandwidth, we'll, we'll do the experiment and, and um, analyze kind of the strengths and weaknesses of these. Mm -hmm. Probably the union of the two resources, right, is better than either alone. And um, it, Almost it, certainly, yeah. Although, right, I might need uh, the, the um, uh, you know, pro proto -A OKN tools, as, as I understand them, may, may be necessary to, to help with this integration, right? I mean, it's like potentially a really hard integration problem, but... Um, yeah. Yes, uh, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, but, but we could, uh, we will at least take a look at it. So th thank you very much oh, for these points. All right, thanks. Um, okay, let me, let me jump into this last part, uh, talking about representations. Um, so... Uh, so what you know why why learn representations? Um, two reasons. So first, you know what we're learning here are vector representations of different elements of of the OKN. Um, those vectors can be pre-computed and cached, and then you can use them to find similar objects quickly using fast indexing techniques. So this is very important if you're doing recommendation or or clustering. Um, 
You can also use their representations directly as features in some downstream model that consumes the, um, the, the OKN. And because they're pre-computed, they can be uh, used in very fast and computationally cheap models. Um, so for this talk, I'm just gonna focus on learning representations for scientific papers, but I'm hoping the ideas are more general, could be used for other types of objects. Papers are just uh, the most important object for us in, in our application. We'll be building on previous models like Spectre and SciNCL, which are trained on scientific documents using citation links. And I'll say more about that in a second. Um, in addition to new ways to learn representations, another problem we aim to solve in this set of work was to improve evaluation practices of paper embeddings. There are lots of benchmarks for text embeddings in general, like for general domains, but few that focus on science in particular. And what our experiments showed is that methods that perform well on general domain tasks don't necessarily perform as well on science. So uh, science-specific benchmarks are important. The primary workhorse behind learning scientific paper embeddings is this contrastive learning method that tries to map papers here represented as titles and abstracts to vector representations with the goal that related documents will have nearby embeddings. Um, in this training, the signal we use to indicate that two documents are related is that they share a citation relationship. Citations are a great signal for this because they are a strong indicator of relatedness and they can be obtained automatically at massive scale. So it's helpful for cre creating training data. So we start with a randomly drawn query paper, PQ, and we find a related paper, P plus, that shares a citation relationship with PQ, and also an unrelated paper, P minus, that doesn't. And then the way we train on this triplet is we adjust the weights of this transformer to reduce a loss that gets smaller as we pull PQ and P plus closer together and push uh, PQ and P minus farther apart. Um, the work we did on paper embeddings has two main contributions. The first was SciRep eval, a new benchmark for evaluating scientific paper embeddings. It's much more comprehensive and diverse than previous benchmarks, as I'll uh, describe in a, in a second. The second was Spectre 2, which is a new paper embedding method that trained on training sets from SciRep eval, and it set a new state of the art on that benchmark. Okay, one of the key contributions of SciRep eval is that it included data sets for evaluating embeddings on a diversity of downstream task formats. And this include, included classification, regression, proximity or nearest neighbor tasks, and finally ad hoc search. Um, so, uh, the, and I guess I'd also say this wasn't just a packaging of existing data sets. Um, what, what we released here was uh, also included eight, uh, eight entirely new data sets released as, as part of this work. Um, so to understand why SciRep eval is useful, um, it's helpful to contrast it with the previous standard benchmark used for scientific paper representations that was called SciDocs. Um, as we dug into the SciDocs benchmark, uh, we, we were dismayed to learn that it had some, some significant problems. And I note, SciDocs was also our work uh, from back in 2020. So I wouldn't say we were, you know, we enjoyed finding that it had all these flaws, but, but it did. So the, the tasks in SciDocs, it turns out, were fairly easy, mostly involved telling quite related papers apart from quite unrelated ones. Um, so it wasn't hard to achieve high accuracy even with, with simple methods. Um, maybe more importantly, the tasks were highly correlated with each other. So if you look at this graph on the right of the slide, the rows and columns are different data sets in SciRep eval, and the color shows how correlated the performance of models in the row task are with those in the column tasks. So this whole square is, is SciRep eval, but SciDocs is included as a subset of SciRep eval, and it's this small red square um, in the lower right-hand corner. So all the red there shows how tightly correlated these SciDocs tasks are with each other, whereas the relatively lower correlation in the rest of the table suggests SciRep eval is a more diverse evaluation benchmark. Um, what else is good about SciRep eval? Um, SciDocs included only evaluation data, whereas SciRep eval adds millions of training examples. And this is on tasks that go beyond just citations. Um, another major goal was finding realistic evaluation settings to make the benchmark practically relevant and to sidestep a whole bunch of pitfalls like annotation artifacts and others that arise when you use artificial evaluations. Our real world tasks included search, author disambiguation, and, and paper reviewer matching. 
Plus, SciRIP eval has a, a more diverse collection of evaluation settings. Okay, so that's SciRIP eval. In addition to that benchmark, we also built a new paper embedding method. Um, this method builds on Spectre 1, which was uh, a, a state-of-the-art paper embedding method for a period of time. Our new Spectre 2 is based on the intuition that a single representation might not be sufficient for representing a given paper. We might need multiple ones. And in particular, we tried training different embeddings for different end task formats. So you'd have one embedding that you'd use if you were trying classification tasks, another for nearest neighbor style proximity tasks, and a third for regression. The schematic illustrations on the slide are intended to give an intuition of why different embedding spaces for those tasks might be helpful. So notice in the embedding space on the left where the circles and triangles represent the data objects being embedded, the triangles and circles can be linearly separated in the plot, which is great if you're doing a classification task where you're trying to draw a boundary between these things. But it might not be as good for a proximity task where you want the nearest neighbors in the embedding, embedding space to be highly related. So notice that in the left-hand graph, some of the triangles are, are quite close to some of the circles. Like Some of the nearest neighbors of the triangles are actually circles. Um, for a proximity task, you'd want something that looks more like the middle graph, where the different object types are grouped into spatially separated clusters. So this is an idealized and you know, wildly simplified, simplified two-dimensional embedding space. But I think it gives you the intuition of why these different end tasks might actually uh, you know, re require uh, different embedding spaces. So we built a, a system that first trained on citations using that, that triple loss I mentioned earlier. And then in a second stage of training, trained task format specific embeddings. So if you want to do a regression task, you use an embedding that's been trained uh, on a regression task in the second stage. Likewise, for classification, you use one that's been trained on, on classification. We looked at a total of four unique task formats. Um, and the short story is, you know, this worked. Uh, uh, we have some evidence that that task format specific training was helpful. Um, although I think further experiments are, are necessary to investigate kind of alternative approaches for how you might partition the task and whether those work just as well. Um, I won't belabor these results, just say they, they were positive against the state of the art at the time. Okay, so all this data and code is, is available. Um, I can uh, I, I can copy and paste these links in, into the chat in a moment. Um, I I would say one one caveat is this is a competitive space. Uh, you, you know uh, I, I believe Spectre Two is still state of the art on on some tasks, um, but for your particular task, uh, your mileage may vary, and it makes sense to experiment with multiple embedding sets. You can find a bunch of these easily on Hugging Face. Uh, we found that GIST embeddings, um, G-I-S-T, work uh, particularly well in some of our applications for, for non-paper embeddings. So that's that's one I'd, I'd recommend you look at. Okay, so to briefly summarize, here's what I talked about. Um, showed a new method for extracting PDFs that uses both textual and visual information and is more efficient at training time than, than previous visual PDF work. Um, that was called Villa. Uh, also, a general toolkit for visual document processing called Paper Mage. Foresight was a method for identifying concepts in science using the citation graph. We were able to obtain high, preci high precision descriptions of those um, using a particular prompt. We intend to release that uh, full resource later in the year. Finally, I talked about a new embedding method that learns different uh, embeddings for different task formats and a benchmark for training and evaluating paper embeddings called SciRep eval. All right, that's all I've got. Thank you very much for your attention. That was great. I think people are thinking too about how they can leverage it. And I think that's why Lou is putting some things in there. Great job, thank you. Oh, Karthik is clapping. <laughs> Any more questions, anybody or comments? And thank you for being so gracious and putting the stuff in the chat, uh, Doug, as you can tell, we said we're a hands-on crowd. Yeah, let me grab those, those other links really quick, but um, thanks everyone. Yeah, thank you. That was great. Any comments or questions, things you want to share with Doug based on what he's working on that any of you might be think would be interesting for him? Yeah, we'd be happy to hear more about what, uh, what, what folks have going on if there's um, interesting problems you want to share, but yeah, happy to take any questions too. Yeah, there's only a few minutes left, so I, I don't know that we're going to get anything more than a superficial 
uh, exchange, but I'll definitely follow up with you, Doug. This is Lou Left, and I'm with the Collab Next team, and we're using uh, Open Alex. But I, I, I'm familiar with Semantic Scholar as well, and I'm interested to see topic classification <laughs> as something that is. Uh, I, I'm I'm realizing as I'm working with other with other Theme One groups, both in our smaller group as well as other conversations that research topics are the most, in, in my opinion, the most natural linkage for integration. Because if you've got a data set about astrobiology, it's not gonna link to most of the other data sets. But if you've got uh, a, another data set that's about a different topic, those two could both say, well, this data set's about these topics in the, in Open Alex or Semantic Scholar or Collabnex, there's, oh, here, these topics are connected to those topics. So rather than saying your particular knowledge graph and entities are, are uh, if you can somehow find something that is connected to a research topic, then you can find adjacent topics. And those are ways of linking, from, in our case, to people and institutions, which can then link you to lots of other research topics. So I think there is an integration there that is, at least for us, an interesting one. Got it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, look forward to to follow ups offline. Um, uh, would would like to hear more about what you're doing uh, and um, the implications it has for our work. Thanks. Uh, can I uh, just ask you a very quick question over here? <clears throat> um, so again, I'm Karthik. So my question is, when you parse the PDF documents using Paper Mage, right? I was just wondering how versatile is that with respect to the formatting of the paper, because for each journal, there could be a different format. Or, or what if it's if, if it's just like a PDF paper without any uh, specified structure to it? Maybe it could be just like two paragraphs or two pages without any for the titles. My my uh, question over here is that, is it, uh, uh, does paper mage work better on a PDF with a predefined schema or a predefined format? Um, yeah, so I guess I, I would distinguish between paper mage and like the, the models that that we developed or, or that others have, have developed <coughs> run within paper mage. Um, so like the paper mage toolkit ought to be sort of flexible to, um, uh, you know, handling a, a variety of different models and, and make certain things more convenient when you're using those models. But yeah, as far as like where the, the models are, are useful, um, it is definitely true. So I mean, we, we saw that set of results where if you say have a model that's trained on, uh, on one set of formats and you know even within the same scientific domain uh, and, and you just wanna to try to apply them, uh, apply those models to a different format within that same scientific domain, um, it's, you know, you actually see very significant performance degradation so I do think that um, you know having sort of a, a wide a wide diversity of formats that you've labeled um, and can train on, and in particular having a representation of, of your target test formats in your training set is actually very important. You know, more important than we realized before. You know, Kathy Chen did did her work. Um, so these models do tend to be pretty brittle to formats. I think they're also quite brittle to target output schema. So yeah, if you go, um, like, uh, if you have a model that's trained on one schema and you try to sort of, in a lightweight way, adapt that to a new schema, so like different target output categories for your tokens, uh, th that actually also tends really not to work very well. So yeah, I would characterize these, these types of models um, that, that are trained on large training sets and are fast and cheap, but um, yeah, but 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 small, right? So not you know GPT four size LLMs. They they tend to be fairly brittle in in those those ways. All right. Yeah. Thank you.